Prices have never been higher. Every single asset class is expensive. Nothing is safe, not stocks, bonds, or even real estate. But before we figure out how to invest in this mess, we need to understand how we got here to a place where everything seems inflated. Allow me to introduce you to the United States Federal Reserve, a central bank unlike any other in the world. The crazy Frankenstein combo that's part private bank and part government agency. The Federal Reserve was created in the early 20th century after a series of financial panics led to an attempt at central control of the monetary system. In challenging economic times, it takes a person with an unusual and diverse background to run the Federal Reserve effectively and not torpedo an already ailing economy. Enter Jerome Powell. Who is Jerome Powell, and how did he get to the head of the Fed? For that, we have to go back a couple of decades. During the global financial crisis of 2008, the Fed squashed short-term interest rates to help stimulate the U.S. economy. Lower interest rates are meant to encourage borrowing and stimulate economic activity. But with already low rates, the Fed had to push them lower than ever before, down to essentially zero for the first time in history. Economists call this 0% interest rate the zero bound, because it was believed you couldn't go below zero. That is until one man, Ben Bernanke, then the head of the Federal Reserve, decided to put the economy into creative mode and perform a radical experiment. What would happen if you pushed interest rates below zero? The math may not have made sense, but Bernanke thought the theory did at least on paper. But someone saw the dangers and knew that if nothing was done, the United States economy could eventually collapse on itself, taking the entire world's monetary system with it. His name, Jerome Powell. Ben Bernanke was at the helm of the Federal Reserve in 2008 when he suggested his bold zero interest plan to battle the financial crisis. His plan was to use a technique called quantitative easing, or QE for short, to increase the available money supply and encourage lending. Now, quantitative easing is basically a fancy way of saying that the Fed is going to buy a bunch of assets to artificially increase the money available for lending and thereby stimulate the entire economy. As far as Bernanke was concerned, all he had to do was make the money available and the activity would come. But let's not forget about Jerome. Unlike Bernanke, Powell was worried. He thought that QE should only be used in absolute emergencies. The consequence of using it too much for too long were unknown at the time. And it was possible that this kind of stimulation was addictive. Once the economy got hooked on the juice, it would keep needing its fix. Was he right? Well, telling you would spoil the entire story. Bernanke's plan definitely had fans in the private sector. Obviously, free money was just fine with the rich and powerful. Speaking of rich, Richard Fisher, the Dallas Fed president, shared a story about Texas Instruments. The company was borrowing $1.5 billion in cheap debt, but didn't plan to use it to build a single factory, invest in research, or hire workers. Instead, the company used the money to buy back their own shares. I spoke with him and he told me, I'm not going to use this money to create a single job. TI was bragging about their plunder, all while the system that Bernanke had designed was actually crushing the same people it was meant to serve. But Bernanke wasn't concerned. His response? Thanks, but I wouldn't worry too much about his opinion. I don't want you to overweight the macroeconomic opinion of private sector people who are not trained in economics. See, this was Bernanke's problem, his indifference to morals or ideals, and his absolute faith in theory. He was so in love with the intellectual discipline of economics that he discounted anyone who wasn't an elite economist. Another person who wasn't an elite economist in Bernanke's mind was Jerome Powell who watched with concern as huge amounts of available money began to distort and twist and change the economy. Bernanke had basically turned on the money printer and let it run, creating an economic monster that might be impossible to stop. So if he wasn't an elite economist, who was Jerome Powell? And why was he so worried? For that, we'll have to go back even a few decades further. Jerome J. Powell grew up in Washington, D.C., the scion of a long line of prominent legal figures. He went to Georgetown Prep, a strict, expensive, and prestigious prep school. He also earned a B.A. from Princeton and a law degree from Georgetown. From his upbringing, he became well-versed in how to behave in the company of the world's most powerful people. And it led to a career at the intersection of private equity and public government, even though he hadn't planned it that way. Powell initially thought that he would follow his father's footsteps and become a corporate lawyer, but 
was lured away by the promise of adventure in the world of corporate debt at a rapidly rising firm called Dillon Reed & Co. Dillon Reed & Co. was more like an elite club than an investment firm. It was exclusive, snobby, and painfully rich. During his time there, Powell learned the fine art of corporate debt creation. While most civilians considered debt to be a bad thing, corporate debt has become a way for Wall Streeters with high IQs and low morals to make an absolute killing. Basically, there are two kinds of corporate debt, corporate bonds and leveraged loans. Both of them can be exploited. A corporate bond is like a standard bank loan, except there's a kicker. Most companies almost never intend to pay them off. Instead, they roll the loan by hiring a bank to sell the debt before it's due. The company selling the debt gets a smaller amount of cash for it because they think there's a good chance that they wouldn't have been repaid anyways. And the buyer is gambling that they'll get paid back eventually for much more than they took the debt for. A leveraged loan, on the other hand, is kind of like a mortgage for a business. Companies might use them to refinance or buy back their own shares. Jay Powell mastered the art of perfectly engineering both of these new forms of leverage while at Dillon Reed, and used them to fuel corporate takeovers, mergers, and acquisitions. This required extreme precision because these loans could blow up at any time, and Powell became very good at it, and also became known for his sense of calm under pressure. But he was just getting started. In 1998, Dylan Reed's chairman, Nicholas Brady, was recruited by Ronald Reagan to become Treasury Secretary, and he took rising star Jay Powell with him as deputy. Powell accepted the position and did just what Reagan and Brady asked, calmly running things like clockwork, until one day he found himself facing a new group of villains. A rowdy group of young, testosterone-fueled Wall Street bros from Solomon Brothers who unironically called themselves the Big Swinging Dicks. As despicable as their name implied, the big swinging dicks had quietly employed a fraudulent scheme to buy up treasury bills through a shell company in an attempt to gain a monopoly on the treasury bill market. And they succeeded. By the middle of 1991, they held 94% of the T-bill supply. The only thing was that this was totally illegal. Fearing criminal charges and massive fines, the higher-ups at Solomon, including the now legendary Warren Buffett, found out about the scheme and wanted to make a deal with the feds. The feds, for their part, knew that if Solomon went down, this could take all of Wall Street down with them. So they sent Jerome Powell to negotiate a deal. And negotiate he did. In fact, Powell did such a good job that he was promoted for his efforts. But Powell's success didn't just earn the approval of the feds, it also attracted the attention of a shadowy but powerful group who'd been watching it all unfold. An organization called the Carlyle Group. The Carlyle Group was no ordinary finance company. Not only were they one of the largest private equity firms in the world, but their questionable investment history included ties to CIA cover-ups, secret arms deals, and possibly even the 9-11 attacks. In fact, Shafiq bin Laden was at Carlyle's annual investor conference while the September 11th attacks were occurring. And those attacks proved very profitable for the Carlyle Group and their subsidiary, United Defense, as defense spending soared post 9-11. Unlike most firms, which were in New York, Carlyle Group was based in Washington. Washington, D.C., and for good reason. Leveraging the connections of Washington insiders was the core of their business strategy. Their roster included a cast of political heavy hitters that even X-Files writers couldn't have dreamed up. But Carlyle's influence was nothing without the second component to their business plan corporate debt, and a lot of it. Once they convinced debt expert Powell to join their team, Carlyle became unstoppable, and Powell helped them to execute one of the biggest deals in their history. One day, Jerome Powell was seated at his desk at Carlisle, flipping through a catalog when he found something interesting, an industrial conglomerate called Rexnord. You've probably never heard of Rexnord, but you've definitely crossed paths with their products. They make boring industrial stuff that helps make the world move. Replacement parts, conveyor belts, that kind of thing. Their business model was similar to razor blade companies. The razor was cheap, but the replacement blades were expensive and very profitable. But all was not well at Rexnord. Despite a strong business model, they had huge debt. The year that Powell became 
became interested in them, Rexnord paid more in interest costs than it earned in profit. But to Powell, that wasn't necessarily a bad thing. He saw something in Rexnord that piqued his interest. They had something that private equity investors valued above all else, a steady cash flow. So Powell put together hundreds of millions of dollars in Carlyle money and outside loans to buy Rexnord. This acquisition would mark the pinnacle of Jay Powell's private equity career. It also provided him with first-hand education on the uses and risks of corporate debt. In fact, because of the high level of debt at Rexnord, soon after the Carlyle acquisition, Rexnord asked his employees to take an hourly pay cut to lower the company's expenses. Meanwhile, none of the money that they borrowed ever went to creating new jobs or giving pay raises to working people. Shades of tech Texas Instruments. But for Jay Powell and his team, that didn't matter as long as there's still room to borrow more. Once Carlyle Group had made their profit and Rexnord was swimming in even more debt, Powell decided it was time to cash out. He found his buyer, Apollo Management LP. Like Powell, they weren't afraid of Rexnord's heavy debt because they believed that Rexnord could borrow even more. Apollo's offer was remarkable. They had raised $1.8 billion, more than twice what Carlyle had paid just four years earlier. And the payoff to Jay Powell and his team was massive. People at Carlyle would talk about the Rexnord deal years later. Later. While we don't know exactly how much profit Powell earned from the sale, because Carlisle is known for keeping pretty good secrets, we do know that Rexnord and their buyout made him oligarch level rich. As for Rexnord, the company was left behind with crippling debt, a shell of its former self. It was no longer a company whose goal was to build products, but instead to service debt. In many ways, Jay Powell's big Rexnord deal marked the end of an era. Although it was still tantalizingly cheap to borrow, it was becoming harder and harder to find companies like Rexnord to suck dry. And that's when a new product was introduced to the market, the Collateralized Loan Obligation, or CLO. Basically, CLOs were package bundles of risky corporate debt that bundled a mixture of low, medium, and high-risk debt all into one product, kind of like layers in a taco. One layer was the frilly lettuce garnish of the deal. That was the AAA rated and pretty safe. But then came a middle layer of cheese called the Mezzanine Group, which was quite a bit riskier. And finally, the package would include a really risky equity portion that was like the day-old tainted meat. No one would have wanted this by itself, but buried among all the taco ingredients, it was easier to get someone to swallow it without being put off. And just like Taco Bell popularized the taco for Americans, CLOs made leveraged loans mainstream for the finance world. After his time in private equity, Powell was nominated by Barack Obama to the Federal Reserve Board of Governors. During his previous stint at the Treasury with Brady and even his first couple years at the Federal Reserve, Powell had never objected publicly to Bernanke's zero interest rate policy. But then one day at a January 2013 Federal Reserve meeting about interest rates, Jay Powell abandoned his previous tone of moderation. Instead, he delivered a prophetic and chilling warning about the dangers of quantitative easing and the effects that this artificial lowering of interest rates and government spending might have on businesses. Powell said that the Fed was potentially creating an asset bubble in the markets for debt, like corporate bonds and leveraged loans. That's government finance guy speak for, if we keep doing this, we're in for a storm of hurt. But why was the famously calm Powell so suddenly disturbed? It came down to one major concern, CLOs, those nasty bundled tacos of exotic, risky corporate debt. Not only did they carry risks that Powell was immediately familiar with, but they were scarily similar to the collateralized debt obligations or CDOs that caused the 2008 financial crisis. Basically, CLOs were the same type of taco as CDOs, but filling it with sketchy corporate loans instead of sketchy mortgages. See, when Powell criticized leveraged loans like CLOs, he was actually speaking from experience from his past life in private equity. He had spent a good portion of his career engineering exactly the kind of risky debt he was now afraid of on a grander scale. The combination of artificially low interest rates and those tempting tacos of dangerous debt made for this high-risk combo meal that everyone wanted a piece of. The industry went from just under $300 billion in 2010 to $400 billion in 2014 and $617 billion in 2018. As demand boomed, the only stopgaps preventing total exploitation in CLOs were something known as covenants, 
Think of them like seat belts meant to protect investors. Or if we want to stretch the analogy, maybe like Pepsid meant to protect investors from the nasty tacos that they were eating. A typical covenant might dictate that a borrower like Rexnord couldn't immediately go and take out more debt. But lenders got even more greedy and started insisting that covenants be left out of deals. These, even riskier loans, made up just 10% of the market in 2010. But by 2019, they accounted for 85% of all leveraged loans. Years later, it would be easy to point fingers at the evil bankers who got rich selling this junk. But financiers were only doing what Bernanke's Federal Reserve gave them incentive to do. Even though real economic growth wasn't being stimulated, asset prices were through the roof. And this gave company executives the chance to exploit their stock even further by buying company shares using the loans that they were getting. By taking these shares off the market, they decreased the total number of shares available to the public and boosted the price of their own shares, making them even richer. Speaking of all these tacos, Yum Brands, the actual owner of Taco Bell, was able to make some massive profits from this exact scheme, boosting its debt to absurd levels. And remember Rexnord, the company where its employees took pay cuts? Well, in 2016, the CEO was paid $1.5 million. But by 2017, when the plant closed, it increased to $12 million. The Fed knew people were doing it, but Bernanke believed the prosperity would eventually make its way down to the common folk through the wealth effect. So they let it continue. It was trickle-down economics all over again. Between 2007 and 2017, the Fed's balance sheet nearly quintupled as it used quantitative easing. Remember QE? To buy up all the assets it could and flood the economy with money. Many Wall Street traders saw clearly what was happening, and they developed a nickname for this, the everything bubble. Everything was clearly overpriced. Both prices and risk tolerance seemed to increase daily. But if everything is expensive, how do we invest? Well, for like Buffett, we can take the needle in a haystack approach, not worrying about the market, but instead sitting and waiting to pounce on a high cash flow, simple business. Or we can look at real assets, something physical and specialized. Commodities tend to perform exceedingly well in times of high inflation. Other options include REITs or real estate investment trusts that allow you to purchase a share of cash flowing real estate with healthy dividends. You can even go more niche within this and look at a REIT that specializes in farmland, like one of Bill Gates' favorite investments, or possibly a Timberland REIT, or you can invest in publicly traded airports, which are extremely hard to replace. While nothing is perfectly safe from the everything bubble, real assets not only offer additional portfolio diversification and inflation protection, but also the potential for high yields. On February 5th, 2018, with Bernanke and his successor long gone, Jerome Powell was sworn in to become the next chairman of the Federal Reserve. Things have come full circle. But what has he done with his extensive knowledge of high-risk debt, its benefits, and its perils? Well, since his appointment, the pandemic happened. The Federal Reserve has doubled its balance sheet in just four years. Interest rates are still at near zero and inflation over 7%. Now, it can be tricky to separate the effects of the pandemic from things that would have happened anyways, but it's hard to tell where Jay Powell stands on handling high-risk debt, both having earned an oligarch's fortune from it and being made keenly aware of its dangers. But with inflation soaring and income inequality on everyone's lips, Powell seems to have been dead on about one thing. Once you open the door to QE, it's nearly impossible to close. Your move, Jay.